Hey guys, this video is on kinetic molecular theory of gases. Um, so this here is what the kinetic molecular theory of gases says. Um, and what the kinetic molecular theory of gases is, it's an attempt to explain the observed behavior of gases. And what it says is this. First of all, that the particles of a gas are really, really small, negligibly small, compared to the distance between them. Um, also that they're moving all the time, constant random motion, move in straight lines until they hit something. When they do, they bounce off. Um, and when they do bounce off, those collisions are what we call elastic collision, collisions. That means no energy is lost to friction or any other, other place. It's conserved. Also, um, the kinetic molecular theory says that there are no attractive or repulsive forces between the gas particles. And finally, that the average kinetic energy of the gas is proportional to the absolute temperature of the gas, um, of the gas particles. Um, so basically what this is saying is that um, gas particles are very small, um, they're always moving. Um, when, they bat, when they hit something, they, the collisions are elastic, um, they don't interact, and the average kinetic en energy of the gas particles is proportional to the average temperature. Oh, um, absolute temperature. Absolute means in Kelvin. So when we talk about an ideal gas, what we're talking about is the gas that, that um, obeys these, these properties of the kinetic molecular theory. Really small, don't interact with each other, um, those, those properties. Um, there is no, no such thing as an ideal gas, but an amazing number of gases actually behave um, as if they are um, ideal gases. Um, you know, real common gases like the gases that comprise air, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, all those. Um, under normal conditions, room temperature and pressure, um, uh, bit, uh, behave very similarly to what an, um, an ideal gas would behave like. And we're going to see more about ideal gases later. And we're going to talk about kinetic energy here for a minute, guys. So remember, we've seen this before. Um, kinetic energy is one half mass times speed squared. So for a single particle, it's just one half the mass of that particle times the speed squared where mass has to be in kilograms, speed in meters per second, so we end up getting kilograms meters squared per second squared, which is joules. Um, now we're going to look at something called the root mean square um, speed. Um, and we're, we're talking about gas particles here. So it's the square root of the mean, the average, that's what this bar means, is the, the mean or the average of the speed squared, um, the sum of those. So RMS, root mean square, so root stands for the root sign, mean, the mean, the average, the bar, and square, S for the square. Um, now, the kinetic, kinetic energy of a single particle is one half mass times its speed squared, but um, we can't calculate that for every single particle in a gas, it's just impossible. But what we can do is um, we can talk about the average kinetic energy of those gas particles, and of one mole, this is for one mole of gas particles. The average kinetic energy will be one half times its molar mass times the speed squared. So instead of the mass, it's the molar mass, um, and it's for for one mole exactly. Um, the only thing to make sure the units work out correctly is this molar mass has to be in kilograms per mole. Watch out for this, guys, because we're so used to using grams per mole. For this calculation, it has to be in kilograms per mole. Um, now it ends up that it, it can be shown that the average kinetic energy of a gas is also equal to 3 halves RT. Um, that derivation is beyond the scope of this class, um, but um, it's, it, it can be shown. So for one mole of an ideal gas, the average kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves RT, where R is the gas constant in units of joules per Kelvin mole, which gives it a value of 8.3145. T is the temperature in Kelvin. Um, so we know two expressions for the average kinetic energy of a mole of ideal gas. If we set them equal to each other, which is what we're doing right here, and then rearrange this to solve for the root mean square speed, so basically divide through by one half molar mass, take the square root, we get this. All right, so this equation here, guys, this is what you're going to use, um, one of the equations you're going to use. Everything up to this point was just an ex explanation of where this equation comes from. It, it was a simple derivation. So it ends up that a gas um, the, um, obeys um, 
what's called a Boltzmann distribution. If we graph the, how many particles of gas have a certain speed, um, we get a, a, what's called a Boltzmann distribution. And it looks like this. Um, there's a peak here, where, the, and then it, it tails off. A couple things about this. Um, first of all, the, the very top of this peak has the most number of particles with that speed. That's the most probable speed. But we deal with the root mean square speed, which is a little bit more. So, you know, this is for oxygen gas at 300 Kelvin. So the most probable speed is going to be, you know, probably about 380 or something meters per second, where the root mean square speed is about 500 meters per second. Um, now, this, this describes the distribution of speeds in a gas. And this is an, actually a pretty important graph to kind of have in your mind. What it shows us is that the, all the particles of a gas are move, they're all moving at you know different speeds. You know, some of them are moving really really fast up here. Some of them are moving really really slow. Not very many, but some. Most of them are right in here. Um, so there's this, this distribution of speeds. We have fast particles, um, slow particles, but we have a, a root mean square speed and a most probable speed. Um, and we can see from the um, formula for root mean square speed that as we increase the temperature the root mean square speed increases right as we decrease the temperature the root mean square speed um, decreases um, and so that what that means basically as we as a gas heats up um, the, on average the particles are moving faster as it cools down on average the particles are moving slower also comparing two different gases at the same temperature the heavier gas, the one with the higher molar mass, is going to have a slower root mean square speed, and the one with the lighter molar mass, the lighter gas, will have a higher root mean square speed because the molar mass is in the denominator here. All right. Um, so this is ex this is showing what I was just talking about. On the left graph here, we look at nitrogen gas. All these graph lines are for nitrogen, just at different temperatures. And we can see as we go from 100 to 200 to 500 to 1,000 Kelvin. The root mean square speed, or the most probable speed, both, they all they shift to the right. The, on average, the, the, the speed of those particles is faster. But also, notice this. The graph broadens out as the temperature increases. So we have a wider distribution of energy um, at a higher temperature. And at a lower temperature, we have a more narrow distribution of energy amongst the particles. This graph over here is shown at the same temperature, but different gases. So these are all noble gases. Um, xenon's the heaviest, helium's the lightest, and the same sort of behavior. The lighter the, the gas, the um, greater the root mean square speed, and also the graph broadens out. The distribution broadens out because the average uh, speed is, is faster. So heavier, slower, lighter, faster, at the same temperature. All right, so here's a little example. Um, we want to calculate the root mean square speed of gaseous mercury atoms at 25 degrees Celsius. So why don't you guys work this out on your own, come on back when you get an answer. Welcome back. So we're going to plug into this formula. Um, R is 8.3145 joules per Kelvin mole. Remember we have to have the temperature in Kelvin, so we add 273.15, giving us 298.15 Kelvin. Um, and the molar mass has to be in kilograms per mole. That's the one that catches most people at first. So watch out for that, guys. So all you do is you find mercury on the periodic table. It's 200.59 grams per mole divided by 1,000. Um, you know, one kilogram per 1,000 grams. And you get 0 0.20059 kilograms per mole. All we do is plug into the root mean square speed equation. And we kind of come up with a root mean square speed of 193 meters per second. All right, diffusion and effusion. First of all, what are they and what's the difference? Um, they both talk about a gas spreading out um, um, from a, a smaller area to a larger area. Um, diffusion is, talks about the mixing of gases. So this picture over here has a, two gases, gases the red and the yellow, separated by a stopcock. You open up the stopcock and what happens is, because these gas particles are in constant random motion, kinetic molecular theory, they're bouncing around all the time, they're going to hit that opening and go through, and they're going to end up being distributed pretty much evenly um, between the two, two um, parts of this container. Um, that's, the same, that's the same reason why um, 
like say you open up a I don't know, a bottle of perfume or something way over in the other corner of the room eventually you're going to smell it because as you open up that bottle of perfume the molecules that give it its odor are diffusing through the the air in the room until they get to your nose um, they dock in a receptor sends a signal to your brain and perfume um, now effusion is a different setup here we have a container with gas on one side we have um, and it starts out with a, a partition that separates the container then we open up this little hole in that that partition and the particles will move through that hole because again kinetic molecular theory they're moving around in constant random motion um, and they um, get something they're gonna hit the hole and go through and at first because there's very few over here most of these are gonna be bouncing around over in here and some will be coming through and they'll keep coming through and coming through and then you know every once in a while one's gonna go back the other way until we start getting more and more particles on the, the empty side, the start, that side that started out as empty. Um, and then once we get to the point where they're, they're uh, moving back and forth at the same rate, there's going to be about the same number on each side and we're at equilibrium. That's effusion. Um, this is, um, it, this is actually, it's pretty useful. They used um, this to separate isotopes of uranium. Um, um, like having a long, long chain of effusion chambers um, because the isotopes have different masses, so they effuse at different rates. Um, so, speaking of rates of effusion, um, how fast the gas diffuses or effuses, called its rate of effusion or diffusion, um, it's proportional to its root mean square speed. Um, the faster, on average, you know, the faster the root mean square speed is, the more often it's going to have a chance to hit that opening and go through. Um, that hole with the effusion and for diffusion it's just moving around faster. Um, we're going to talk we're going to talk about it in terms of effusion here. So we can say the rate of effusion is proportional to so it's equal to the root mean square speed times some constant. Um, but we know the root mean square speed is square root of three RT over M. If we take the ratio of the rates of effusion of two different gases, the constant of proportionality cancels. So the rate of effusion of gas one over the rate of effusion of gas two is equal to the root mean square speed of gas one over the root mean square speed of gas 2, um, which is equal to the square root of 3RT over M1 over square root of 3RT over M2. Now notice the 3RTs cancel, and we end up with this simple equation here, square root of M2 over the square root of M1. Notice it's inverted. This is called Graham's Law of Effusion. Put this on your card to use it. And what it says is that how fast one gas effuses compared to how fast another gas effuses is equal to the ratio of the square root of the molar mass of the second gas over the square root of the molar mass of the first gas. So watch out. See how they're inverted? People, um, at first, they, they tend to forget that. All right, so now we come to the point where we do another example. So a certain gas effuses 1.86 times as fast as xenon under the same conditions, so in the same container, same temperature. What's the molar mass of this gas? Given that that gas is a halogen, which gas is it? All right, so why don't you guys go ahead and work this out yourself. When you get an answer, come on back. Welcome back. So um, we're going to use Graham's Law of Effusion, where um, I'm going to put the unknown gas is X on the top, and xenon is right on the bottom, which means the molar mass of xenon goes on the top. Our unknown molar mass goes on the bottom. Now, when you're told that the, a gas effuses one point, you know, whatever, some number of times as fast, that means the ratio of the rate of effusion of that gas to the other gas is equal to that number, 1.86. So we just put, for the ratio of the rates, we just put 1.86 and then equal to this ratio of the molar masses. Because we want the molar mass of the unknown gas, we rearrange this, cross multiply, square root of the molar mass of our unknown gas is equal to the square root of the molar mass of xenon over 1.86. But we know the molar mass of xenon. Look it up in a periodic table. 131.293 grams per mole. So to get the molar mass of the unknown gas, we square both sides of this equation. We get this right here. Plugging in, we get about 38 grams per mole. Um, that's fluorine because atomic fluorine has a molar mass of about 19, so it's a diatomic, one of the Hofbrinkle elements. So F2 um, is about 38 grams per mole. And that's all there is to it, guys.